When I was a kid, I was 100% absolutely certain that when I grew up, I was going to be famous. More than that, I actually had a plan for how I would become famous. See, I was going to be able to transition my uh, 12 NBA championships, my four NBA MVPs, my four Olympic gold medals, my two-time defensive player of the year, my rookie of the year, all while being the starting shooting guard for the Los Angeles Lakers, into a successful movie career. My breakout role, of course, would have been as playing Captain America, but only because I'm too tall to play Batman. (laughs) Essentially, I was going to be Dwayne Johnson, but basketball instead of wrestling. So I like to think he followed my plan. Probably not what really happened. But now that as I'm older, uh, I'm not really interested in becoming famous. In fact, I don't want to be famous in any way, shape, or form. And really, it's partly because... A lot of the people that are famous today, we're finding out that they're not exactly the person that we thought them to be. We found out a a, a lot about these people who are on the magazine covers and who make millions of dollars, and we're finding out that there's more going on behind closed doors than any of us are really comfortable with. It's not like this sort of thing is new. We've seen this happen all throughout history, but in this day and age of social media, word travels fast. Bad news gets spread a lot quicker than what we are used to seeing. And we become more and more aware of things that we didn't want to know. And we find out that these people who have been adored by millions have sinister things going on behind the scenes that nobody knows about. They seem to think that their fame or their power or their wealth is going to make them untouchable. Unable to have to face the consequences for this. Their pride and their hubris has led to some very public downfalls. And we could go on with a huge list, but I'll give you just a few off the top of my head here. Kevin Spacey was one of the most sought-after actors in all of Hollywood. He's now awaiting trial in a federal court in New York. He has several lawsuits awaiting him whenever that trial is over, and he's likely never going to work a day again. Singer R. Kelly was one of the most popular singers of the late 90s and the early 2000s. He had a soulfulness to his singing that people were just captivated by. He had a prowess in the music industry that was incredible. And a little over a week ago, he was was sentenced to 30 years in our federal prison. Lori Loughlin was America's aunt. Full House was one of the most popular sitcoms. She was Aunt Becky. And now her reputation is forever tarnished and changed by her actions. Roseanne Barr got herself removed from the sitcom that had her name on it. That's impressive. Matt Lauer was once considered a respected journalist. I could keep going. And all of these are within like the last five years. We're not even talking about OJ. That's a whole story in and of itself. But all of these people have had these amazing falls from grace. At one point in time, they were considered the top of what they of anybody else. We wanted to be like these people, and yet every single one of them has seen their actions have major consequences and drastically changed their lives. They have had their fans, their friends, even their families abandon them because the person who was behind the screen was far different than the person on the screen. And yet in each and every one of these cases, there's one thing that we can point to as their downfall. In each and every one of this, we can look at one element that is consistent in all of them. It's pride. Their pride told them that because they were special, or because they were unique, or because they had this talent, or because they had amassed this kind of power, that they could do or say whatever they want without consequence. And yet in each and every case, Their falls were made that more drastic because of their pride. We've seen throughout human history, pride lead to some destructions and some falls and lives utterly ruined. But as as captivating, as breathtaking, as as awe-inclusive these stories might be to us in 2022, none of these falls even hold a candle to the person who fell in our text today. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 4, so if you've got your Bible, please go ahead and move there. Daniel 4 is a bit of an oddity in the book of Daniel. 
in that this particular section of scripture doesn't even seem like it was written by anyone else. It's, it's almost like this particular chapter was written by Nebuchadnezzar himself. Once again, we kind of see Daniel playing a background character, which I find weird to have a whole book named after you and you're basically a bit player. But that's essentially what seems to be happening in the book of Daniel and in this particular narrative itself. I want to remind you of who Nebuchadnezzar was. Nebuchadnezzar was more than just a big deal at this particular stage of history. We've seen in our study and in this text that he's a little bit of an eccentric leader, to say the least. We remember we said that eccentric is because you're wealthy. When you're poor, you're just crazy. So that's how that works. But Nebuchadnezzar was a very important his, uh, historical figure. If we look at our own history, Nebuchadnezzar was a major player at one point in time. He was the ruler of Babylon during the Chaldean era. And in the Chaldean era, Babylon was the nation. They were the superpower. They were the ones that every other nation kind of fell under their rule. The Chaldean era had been started by Nebuchadnezzar's father, Nabopolassar, which is a really fun name to say, and I highly recommend you name a child after him. He kicked off that age, but Nebuchadnezzar took things to the next level, creating what would become an amazing uh, kind of a, a blanket statement for some, several kingdoms to come after Babylon. He was not only a frightening military leader, but he was also an amazing diplomat. He was good at, at intermingling with other people and getting people to follow him simply because he seemed like such a nice guy. But if you were against him, he was ruthless. He would take you down without a, without a moment's notice. In fact, in some historical circles, Nebuchadnezzar is still referred to as Nebuchadnezzar the Great. But for most of us, we tend to ascribe that moniker to somebody who would follow just a little bit later became a little more synonymous with it. But Nebuchadnezzar was a hugely powerful figure. He was the most important man. He was the, the leader of the nation that led. He was behind all of it. And in this text today, we see Nebuchadnezzar is at the height of his power and his influence. But that's when it all started. See, Daniel chapter 4 opens up with a, a, a kind of a narrative that we have seem to have read already. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And we read about this experience in Daniel 4, verses 4 through 5. It says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. How nice for you. I had a dream and it frightened me. While in my bed, the images and visions in my mind alarmed me. Now again, we've, we've seen this already. We've actually just talked about this a few weeks ago. So this seems very familiar already. Nebuchadnezzar is once again having a dream. And this dream has got him worried. It's, again, like somebody is trying to tell Nebuchadnezzar something, but for the life of him, he doesn't understand it. He can't figure it out, and he needs some help interpreting this dream. And so he does what he's done before. He calls together the Chaldeans, which, again, just a big fancy word for wise men. He calls together uh, uh, the diviners, the mediums, and he calls the uh, magicians. Can you tell me my dream? No, but is this your card? I don't get it. But anyway, at this time, he's a little more upfront, though. When it comes to this particular dream, he's a lot more upfront. If you recall a couple weeks ago, when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, he wanted them to tell him what the dream was, which is weird. But this time, he's upfront. He tells them exactly what the dream is, and so you know this is kind of serious to him. He tells these wise men this dream, and they're no help. Once again, they can't tell him what this dream means. They can't, can't help him navigate all of this. So you've got to wonder, why does he keep asking these guys? But then Nebuchadnezzar gets it in his head. Hey, why don't I ask Daniel? And I'm sorry, I, I, I got I to call a timeout here. You would think with the history between Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel that Daniel probably should have been the first call he makes, right? I mean, think about what we've talked about the last several weeks. Daniel has been the smartest guy in the room from day one. As a teenager, a teenager, he turned down the king's food and the king's wine in favor of vegetables and water. When Nebuchadnezzar went in and interviewed all the kids that were a part of this particular program, he himself said that nobody was better than Daniel and his friends. In fact, not only was Daniel so smart, he was, not only was he smarter than all the kids in that room, he was smarter than most of Nebuchadnezzar's staff. And so at a very young age, Daniel and his friends were placed in positions of influence and power. The last time that Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, nobody else could tell him what the dream was or what the dream meant. 
except for Daniel, who not only interpreted the dream, but stated crystal clear what the dream was to begin with. How in all of that history is Daniel your last option? Unbelievable. And yet he comes and, 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 and Nebuchadnezzar explains what the dream is. In the dream, Nebuchadnezzar sees a tree. That's a fun dream to start off with, right? You're fading off into sleep and all of a sudden you see a tree. It's going to be a good night. This particular tree grows large and strong, and it reaches to the point that uh, it's able to reach out to the entire sky. It is visible throughout the world. That's a big tree. It has beautiful leaves, and it has enough fruit for everyone. It provides shelter for animals and birds. It's just a great tree all the way around. But then a watcher comes down from heaven and states that the tree needs to be cut down. That its stump needs to be left in place. That a band of iron and bronze put on it to keep it from being destroyed. To keep the roots intact. Then the watcher says something really weird. He says that the tree's mind, I didn't know trees had minds, will be changed from that of a human to that of an animal. The dream finishes with verse 17 where we read, This word is by decree of the watchers. And the decision is by command from the holy ones. This is so that the living will know that the Most High is ruler over human kingdoms. He gives them to anyone he wants and sets the lowliest of people over them. This is a weird dream. And it's perfectly understandable, I think, that Nebuchadnezzar would be a little nervous about this and and maybe even a little scared about what this dream could possibly be. But I don't think Daniel's reaction to the dream is going to make him feel any better about it. We see in verse 19 in the first part, it says, Then Daniel, whose name was Balthazar, which is another great name, was stunned for a moment. And his thoughts alarmed him. Not a real good sign if the guy who's supposed to interpret the dream is scared of the dream. But Nebuchadnezzar has to know. He wants to know what this dream means. He doesn't care if it's going to be negative for him. He just needs to know, what does this mean? And so he asks Daniel, please interpret this for me. But before Daniel does, at the end of verse 19, Daniel starts off by saying this. He says, my Lord, may the dream apply to those who hate you and its interpretation to your enemies. This isn't going to go well. Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that in the dream, the tree is him. That he has become this great and strong overseer of the entire known world. But when it comes to the second part of his dream, it's not great news. Daniel gives us interpretation in verses 24 through 26 where we read, This is the interpretation, your majesty, as this is the decree of the Most High that has been issued against my lord the king. You will be driven away from people to live with the wild animals. You will feed on grass like cattle. You'll be drenched with dew from the sky for seven periods of time until you acknowledge that the Most High is ruler over human kingdoms. He gives them to anyone that he wants. As for the command to leave the tree stump with its roots, your kingdom will be restored to you as soon as you acknowledge that heaven rules. This is a heavy declaration. Understand that Nebuchadnezzar has just found out that not only is he going to lose his kingdom, not only is he going to lose his power, not only is he going to lose his influence, he's going to lose his mind. He's going to go insane that his actions have led to this particular point that God himself is decreeing that he's going to cut him down until he's willing to acknowledge who is really in charge here. Daniel even goes so far as to say, well, maybe God will stop this if you just start doing the right thing. Maybe if you start giving out to the poor, maybe this could stop. This doesn't have to be this way. But God is trying to tell you, Nebuchadnezzar, that your pride is going to end up taking you somewhere you don't want to be. It's going to lead you down a path that you don't want to go. Daniel leaves and, and kind of lets everything settle. But one year later, One year after this event, Nebuchadnezzar is out on his roof of his palace. 
And he's kind of overlooking all of Babylon with its beauty and its wonder. And I, I challenge you this week, go find a history book or, or get online somewhere and actually look it up because Babylon was really impressive. Just the nation itself was an impressive, beautiful nation, had one of the, the eight wonders of the world within it, all during Nebuchadnezzar's time period. And as Nebuchadnezzar is looking out at the beauty and the wonder of Babylon, he thinks to himself, I know who's all responsible for this. We read in verse 30, Nebuchadnezzar says, Is this not Babylon the great that I have built to be a royal residence for my vast power and my majestic glory? What a great phrase. Nebuchadnezzar, in this moment, believes that he is the one who's responsible for this. We've seen this kind of self-focus and self-interest in Nebuchadnezzar before. We've seen this pride kind of play itself out. But this is Nebuchadnezzar saying, I'm the one responsible for all of this. That this all exists for me. No sooner than does he say this. In fact, the, the first part of verse 31 says, while the words were still in the king's mouth. He hears a voice from heaven telling him it's all about to be taken away from him. His kingdom, his power, his influence, his wealth, gone. All in a moment. More than that, he's going to lose his sanity. He's going to live like a wild animal, just as Daniel had told him. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 33 tells us at that moment, the message against Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people. He ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with dew from the sky until his hair grew like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird claws. Really think about this for a moment. This is another one of those times where we're reading scripture, we have a tendency to just kind of keep going and get to the next part. But I want you to stop and think about this for a moment. Because this isn't just anybody who's going cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs here. This is the leader. This is when Babylon is a global superpower and Nebuchadnezzar is the leader of Babylon. And in a moment, he's lost any semblance of sanity. The guy who spent his life in the finest of clothes and in the cushiest of houses is now living outside among wild animals. A guy who's been pampered his whole life, likely having teams of people all designed just to make him look good, now has crazy hair and fingernails that are super long. The guy who used to eat the finest food is now eating grass. This is the most prolific symbol of power and authority. This is the guy in charge of everything, and he's lost it. This is, if this word got out of all of this, this would have huge ramifications, not just for Babylon, not just for his friends and family. This would have huge ramifications for the entire world. That the king has gone off his rocker. This is what has to happen, all because he's allowed his pride to tell him what likely everybody around him has said for his entire life, that he's amazing, that he's the best, that everything is for him. Nebuchadnezzar was willing to buy into his pride and it cost him everything. In a moment, God has shown not just Nebuchadnezzar, he's shown the entire world that it is actually he who allows these people to be in these positions. And in an instant, he can take it away. And it's not until Nebuchadnezzar is finally ready to acknowledge God. To acknowledge that God is the one who's in charge of all of this, that his sanity is finally restored to him. He goes through seven periods, and, and most biblical scholars believe it to be a seven-year period. So for seven years, the king's nuts. A lot of damage can happen in seven years. And yet whenever Nebuchadnezzar turns towards God, his sanity is restored, and more than that, his entire life is restored. Verses 34 through 36 tell us the whole thing. He says, but at the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven, 
My sanity was returned to me. Then I praised the Most High and honored and glorified Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of earth are counted as nothing, and He does what He wants with the army of heaven and the inhabitants of earth. There is no one who can block His hand or say to Him, What have you done? At that time, my sanity returned to me. My majesty and splendor returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and my nobles sought me out. And I was reestablished over my kingdom and even more greatness came to me. Pride is such an odd thing. It's such a weird thing for us to consider pride. And yet I would say it's something that probably all of us struggle with on some level. Each and every one of us can see pride in other people. We can see them kind of teetering on that brink from being just self-confident to being full-on prideful. But it's nearly impossible for us to see it in ourselves. I think the reason for that is fairly simple, and that's because all of us, we view ourselves as the hero of our own story. While we never vocalize it, there's still that part of us in the back of our mind that believes the entire world revolves around us. Pride is such an odd thing for every single one of us. For Our pride can be like Nebuchadnezzar's and it could be that self-glorification and thinking that everything good should be coming our way because that's what we deserve. But pride can also show itself in some pretty unusual places, places that we wouldn't expect pride to be. It can be that voice in the back of your head telling you that you got to do this yourself. It's that idea, that concept of you got yourself into this mess, so you got to be the one to get yourself out. It's that part of us that, as much as we don't want to acknowledge it, it makes us feel like we're too good to be around some people. It can be that voice that tells us the only person that we can trust is ourselves. Can I tell you, pride is a liar. It keeps us locked into the same struggles and the same problems that we'll have for years, for most of our lives. And really, the only way for us to be able to keep pride in check is to remind ourselves of something that we already know, to keep things in their proper perspective. See, the reality is is that everything and everyone is temporary. Everything in this world has an expiration date. At some point in time, it's all going to end. No matter how powerful the person They still bleed red, and one day they're going to be in the ground. It doesn't matter if they're a famous movie star, if they're a CEO, or if they're the president himself. Because in that moment, they'll be face to face with the one who is truly forever. Pride tells us to trust only in ourselves and our abilities. But God tells us to trust in him, to trust in what he can do because he is the only true power. He was there at the beginning of it all. He'll be there at the end of it all. He is the only one who can lay claim to that. He is the one who gives us the gifts and the talents to be able to do anything that we do in our lives. And he could just as easily take all of that away from us. Therefore, he is the only one who is truly worthy of all glory and honor and praise. As John the Baptist put it in John chapter 3, verse 30, our mindset needs to be that he must increase and I must decrease. Make no mistake, folks, pride is a difficult thing for us to overcome. For Nebuchadnezzar, it took losing everything for him to understand who was really the one worthy of any glorification. This is the same guy. If you think about Nebuchadnezzar's history, it doesn't make sense that he ever got to this point, right? This is a guy who firsthand witnessed God moving in the lives of other people. He saw it crystal clear. Most recently we talked about he saw three guys go into a furnace, but four guys be in the furnace. And then those same three walk out unscathed. Nebuchadnezzar had seen the power of God, but it wasn't until he was willing to acknowledge God's power and authority until he was willing to acknowledge his proper place that God restored his sanity to him. Many of us, we we encounter 
the acts of God in our lives. We see God move in the lives of other people. And yet there's still that part of us that refuses to trust in him. There's still that part of us that says, I got this. We got to let that go. Because the reality is, is we got nothing. God's got it. And we need to trust in him in that. As Nebuchadnezzar realized who the true authority and who true power was, he concluded his narrative with verse 37. And we're going to close with this today. He says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and glorify the king of the heavens, because all his works are true and all his ways are just. He is able to humble those who walk in pride.